Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar, Understanding RSPs and Your Will. It's my pleasure to join you this evening. It's, uh, my name is Debbie Moore and I'm with the team at Advisors with Purpose. I um, am just facilitating this evening. I am not the speaker. I'm just here to answer any questions uh, and to uh, make sure that the technology goes all right. So hopefully you can hear us and you can see the presentation on the screen and we're going to get started and jump right into this evening's topic. My pleasure to introduce our speaker. His name is Bill Hurdle. Bill joined the team at Advisors with Purpose in 2019 as an estate advisor. He graduated from Mount Allison University in 1977. Bill received his Chartered Professional Accountants degree, CPA, and he's a Chartered Accountant, which is a CA designation in 1979. Bill and his wife Janice moved to Peace River, Alberta in 1982 where Bill practiced public accounting with a national accounting firm until, until his retirement in 2018. During Bill's time in public practice, he developed a wide range of experience in assurance, tax, estate planning, and general consulting. Bill has been actively involved in his community, serving in several areas, including a community foundation and a board member and treasurer at his local church. Bill enjoys sports and has been an organizer and coach and referee in a number of sports over the years. Bill and Janice recently moved to New Brunswick, back to be closer with friends and family. They have four children as well as four grandchildren. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Hurdle to join us this evening. Bill? Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, Everyone, thank you for taking uh, Wednesday evenings off that um, uh, I know there's a hockey game on tonight and I'm, uh, I'm, not an, uh, I'm not a public speaker. So if I um and ah a little bit, then uh, I apologize up front. Um, I know we probably have a variety of people uh, at different ages. Um, they're... Uh, um, different stages of life and you all have different circumstances. So hopefully we can provide enough broad information that some of it will be applicable to you. And uh, some questions that you think about as, as you look at your unique situation. Um, quickly, as we look at our agenda, we're gonna take a brief look, uh, not very in depth, but a brief look at RSPs. Um, and then, uh, because I, I figure most of you are looking at retirement or are retired or at least dreaming about retirement, um, I think we'll spend a little bit of time talking about retirement. Uh, we'll look at options for what, the, uh, what you can do with your RSPs uh, at that time. We'll look at uh, what happens when you pass away, um, what happens to your RSPs. And we'll briefly touch on TFSAs as well. Um, we'll look at a few options with estate and gift planning, and a couple of examples. And then finally, we'll wrap up with um, some, uh, some options, I guess, if you'd like to uh, um, have a personalized planning session with us. Um, and after that, we will have a brief, brief, uh, question period. So, uh, all right, now, I just gotta get the, there we go. So, when we look at our RSPs, throughout our lifetime, we have um, been encouraged to, to contribute to RSPs. And, you know, you might wonder, at the point that you're at now, why, why do we do that? But it is to save for retirement in a tax efficient way. Um, because the contributions are tax deductible, it allows us to put more money away than if, we, uh, if it wasn't tax deductible. Uh, it allows us to earn the money tax free as we're going. And um, unfortunately, when it comes to retirement and cashing in those RSPs, they become taxable income. 
And the other unfortunate part is that uh, uh, because all of our senior benefits in Canada are tied to our net income, um, there are a lot of negative connotations to having a substantial cash flow out of your, your RIF, RIF uh, payments. Um, and then there's also this looming tax bill. Uh, if you have any substantial amount of money in an RSP um, because of what happens on death. You know, we, we save our whole lives um, thinking, uh, you know, we put the money away when we're paying a high tax rate. And then we, the idea was that we would pull it out in retirement when we have a low tax rate. Uh, unfortunately, if something happens to us prematurely, uh, we end up having a big lump sum, and that's not the most tax efficient way for the, uh, for the income to come in. Now, there are a lot of technical rules around RSPs, and it's beyond the scope of this particular uh, webinar, but in general, that's how they work. Um, so when we look at retirement, um, the number one question that most financial planners receive is how much is enough? And the reality is that, is that there is no right or wrong answer. Um, the best answer I can probably give you is it depends. <laughs> it, um, it depends on things uh, like your current income. Uh, somebody that's making $40,000 a year is going to have a very different lifestyle from somebody who's making $140,000. Uh, your general health condition is going to um, give some indication, number one, of your, your longevity in life. I mean, none of us know for sure when we're going to die, but um, your general health will give you some indication and it'll also give you some indication as to uh, the costs of health care that you're going to face in retirement. Um, and then if we look at costs in retirement, um, you have to think how is your, um, how is your cost of living going to change uh, as our lifestyle changes, um, when we when we look at doing traveling uh, with, um, if that's what you want to do in retirement, is travel the world, uh, it's going to cost a whole lot more money than somebody who likes to stay at home and enjoys doing things around the house. Um, so when I was approaching retirement, um, my wife used to say to me quite a bit, you should be retiring to something, not just retiring from something. And it wasn't until I um, started preparing for this webinar that I realized that's actually a quote from Harry M. Emerson Fosdick, an American pastor. And so uh, I think the idea there is that in retirement, you don't just stop life. Um, there's, there's another quote that, uh, uh, that I like, and it says, uh, never stop doing the things that make you smile. And really the things that make you smile are your passions in life. And uh, so it, it, it's important that you find what it is in retirement that you want to do. So as you can see, there's a lot to consider there as to how much you're going to need. And it's very much a personal choice uh, and it's different for every individual. So some sources of ret uh, retirement income, almost all of us will, will re be receiving old age security and Canada pension plan but for most of us, that's not going to be enough. Uh, some of us are lucky to have lucky enough to have a, a government pension plan or a company pension plan. Uh, for others, we may have money set aside in, in RSPs and RIFs. 
um, maybe some in TFSAs. And some of us may be lucky enough to have um, some set aside in non-registered investments, whether that's the stock market or whether it is um, GICs or uh, savings accounts, or for that matter, for the, the, your, your mattress may have some of it as well. So, um, and then other sources of income might be, you, you may have rental properties that you have cash flow from, uh, that you can sell and, and have retirement income. You may have business assets that can be sold um, to do that. And then probably a, a large investment for a lot of us is our principal residence. Uh, a lot of us have a lot of equity tied up in, in, uh, in that beast. Um, so what is the difference between an RSP and uh, a registered retirement income fund? For the most part, they're very similar. Um, there's no major difference in the investments that can be made and, and withdrawals from both of them are taxable. Now, once you've converted from a, an RSP to a RIF, you can't make any more contributions. Um, and also once you've converted to the RIF, you have mandatory withdrawals that are designed to to um, make you draw out everything by roughly the, roughly the time you're in your late 90s. <laughs> um, so it, um, for purposes of this webinar, we're going to use the terms interchangeably. If I refer to a RIF and to an RSP, um, it's basically the same thing. Okay, so at age 71, uh, you are forced to cash in your RSP. Um, now, you may do it, you may well do it before you're 71, but in the year that you turn 71, you have to do it. So um, your options are really threefold. You can take cash from your RSP, um, which has a very negative tax connotation. If you know, like if you've got a hundred thousand there and you want to take the hundred thousand out, you have to pay tax on it. Um, you can buy an annuity uh, and there's all kinds of permutations and variations of that. Um, or what most people do is you convert your RSP to a RIF. There's also the option you could do some combination of the above, whether it's, um, you know, whatever your needs are at the time. But the reality is in today's day and age, most of us choose the RIF option. And for the main, the main reason for that is that we, uh, um, we still have control of it similar to what we have with the RSP. So on death, um, I'm going to, before we talk about death, um, I'm going to spend some time explaining some terms. Uh, so the, the name, there's two things you can do. You can either name a beneficiary to your um, RIF or or you can name what's called a successor annuit in all provinces except Quebec. Quebec, it has to go through your estate. So, um, so the beneficiary, the successor annuit is only your spouse can be that, but the beneficiary could be a qualified beneficiary or a non-qualifying beneficiary. Um, so we'll, we'll go over that in a minute, but um, the, the difference between a beneficiary and a successor annuant is simply that uh, the successor annuant 
um, just assumes your position in the uh, with the VIF. So if you um, uh, if you have a hundred thousand dollar VIF and you pass away and leave it to your spouse, who is a successor annuant, um, they just step into your position and continue to receive receive the in, same income uh, as you received. Now, if you were a beneficiary uh, of it, you would actually have to cash in the, uh, the RIF and put that money into your own RSP or RIF on the assumption that that's the way you want to do it and, and not pay the tax. Um, so really there's not a lot of difference. Uh, Paper-wise, it's a little bit easier to have the successor annuant. Um, so hopefully that clears up some of the confusion on beneficiaries and, and uh, sp uh, successor annuants, et cetera. Um, so in general, when you pass away, uh, I mean, in general, you, you deem to dispose of all your assets, not just your RIF, but you, are, you dispose of your RIF and it becomes taxable income unless you pass it on to a qualified beneficiary. So the, the three types of qualified beneficiaries are your spouse or common law partner, your uh, financial dependent, infirm child or grandchild. So that's... Um, somebody that's over the age of 18, but is eligible for the uh, disability exemption uh, and is financially dependent upon you. And then the other one is if you've got financially dependent children or grandchildren under the age of 18. Um, now it's not, in necessarily part of the seminar, but I did want to talk just briefly uh, about the TFSAs. And, and the, the big difference between TFSAs and RIFs is that when you pass away, the TFSA is not taxable income. The reason is, is because you've never deducted it from income when you put the money into it. So, um, that being said, uh, there are some, some considerations. Similar to a RIF, uh, you can have a successor holder, it's called with a TFSA, who again is your spouse, um, or you can have a beneficiary for your TFSA. Uh, now, similar to, um, to the RIF, there's not a lot of difference between having it as a beneficiary or a successor holder, but there is a difference in taxation. Um, if you, as a successor holder, and you just move into that person's position with their TFSA, so all the income would then be tax-free. As a beneficiary, because the income has to be paid out, from the date of death until you get it paid out, uh, it becomes taxable income in general. So um, if it's going to be any significant amount of time, uh, you know, you may, may want to have a successor holder versus a beneficiary if, if it's possible. Um, okay, so like I say, that was just sort of an extra. Uh, we don't not going to spend a lot of time on TFSAs, but just so you have a rough idea what's happening with it. So then if we talk about non-qualifying beneficiaries, um, basically your non-qualifying beneficiary is anybody that's not a qualified beneficiary. So it could be any individual in your family, and it could be, or it could be any individual outside your family, technically. And it also can, can be a charitable organizations or other organizations for that matter. 
Um, the, now the one, uh, the one caution that I guess I would would put out is when you're um, when you're naming a beneficiary that's not a qualified beneficiary, um, you've got to remember that that income is fully taxable on your final return, but the money goes tax-free to the beneficiary. So in the case of, um, let's just say you've got a $100,000 uh, RIF sitting there and you've left it to your, to your kids. Um, and just for argument's sake, you've got two kids. <laughs> Um, so they each get a check for $50,000, but the estate still has to pay that tax on the $100,000 um, on your final return. Now, hopefully the kids are the uh, part of the beneficiaries as well of the estate um, and there's cash around to do that. Otherwise it can put the uh, executor into a, um, an awkward situation, I guess. Now, the other thing with naming a charitable organization as your non-qualified beneficiary, um, again, you still have to pay the tax on your final return, but because of the donation receipt from the, um, from the charitable organization, it will offset most or all of the taxes depending on uh, which province you're in. Um, so uh, why would you ever name a beneficiary for your estate? There's a couple of reasons that it's done. It's done uh, number one, to, uh, so that the money doesn't flow through your estate and uh, you have to pay probate fees on it. And number two, it does get the money to the beneficiaries a little bit quicker than uh, and, and on a, on a better, more timely basis, I guess, uh, than flowing it through the estate. So what happens if you either you don't name a beneficiary or you name the, your estate as the beneficiary, which some people do. Um, so whatever the terms of the will is at that point, um, that's how that's how the uh, RIF funds would be administered at that point. It would also be subject to the probate fees, as I as I mentioned before. And some of the probate fees, depending on the province you're in, some of them can be fairly significant. Um, now, if the estate uh, passes those funds through to a qualified beneficiary. So if under the terms of your will, um, your spouse uh, is, you know, your spouse is the beneficiary under the will and that money goes into her RSP, uh, then it can be tax deferred at that, pro at that point. Uh, the problem is, is, is when you do that, there are instances where the spouse will not want to pay tax on it. <laughs> and I've had some of these in, in public practice where uh, the spouse doesn't want to have to pay tax later on, on those funds. So she wants the, well, in this case, it was a she, but it, um, but that the spouse doesn't want to pay the tax right away or, or doesn't want to pay the tax um, down the road. So they want to the estate to pay it right away before they take it over. Um, so, um, so the really the only time that the preference is to have it going through the estate um, is number one, if the funds are needed for the for final expenses, uh, or number two is if it's 
needed to pay taxes, whether it's on the RIF or other assets that are in the estate, or uh, once in a while you have a situation where you need the funds to make sure there's even distribution amongst the beneficiaries of the will. Now I wanna just talk a minute about a contingent beneficiary. There are some circumstances where you may want to do this. Um, the, uh, um, first off, like a contingent beneficiary is just what it, uh, what it says. <laughs> it's contingent on something else happening that you become a beneficiary. So um, normally it's used, uh, um, so if, if you know where your money, where you want your money to go as a couple uh, after the last of the two of you die, um, then you may want to put that secondary beneficiary on at that point. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you could name your kids or you could name a charitable organization as a contingent beneficiary. Now, some financial institutions have trouble with naming contingent but beneficiaries. So make sure you check with your financial advisor before you uh, go too far down the road with this, uh, this, thing, this idea. So um, believe it or not, once in a while people do end up saving too much for retirement. Um, when you get to the point that your monthly income is more than your monthly outflow. And like in retirement, your costs um, can, you know, your cost of living can be retired, or can be reduced. Um, the, you know, you, you usually don't travel around town as much. You're not driving to work every day. Um, your, uh, I mean, you, if you travel around the world, you may be spending money, but, um, and the other thing is, is, is you don't have to save for retirement anymore because you're already there. And, you know, if you look at how much you put into spend on retirement each year, um, you, you know, in, in general, your, your costs can go down. Um, now, if you end up with a significant amount of money, you're going to end up with this old age security clawback. In 2021, if your income is your net income is greater than 79,845, you are in that situation. So, if you find yourself in that situation, you may consider, um, you know, the following items. I guess, um, like. Earlier conversion of RIF, if you think you're going to be in this situation, if you're 60, maybe you want to convert your RIF earlier and start taking the money out, spread it over a longer period of time. Um, if you're over 65 as a couple, uh, you can split income with your spouse, the pension income, and your RIF income does qualify as pension income. Uh, your minimum payments. If you use the younger age for the to uh, uh, to spread out your RIF payments until you're 95, um, then it, it'll be a less each each year. And there's also this new beast that the uh, federal government came up with called a. Uh, an advanced life deferred annuity where you can put 25% of your RIF into a, to this fund and not pay tax on it until you have to pull it out at 85. Um, it's, it's fairly new, so it hasn't been, uh, I, I don't think a lot of people have used it yet, but it, uh, um, it is available now. You want to make sure you maximize your TFSA because remember everything that's in a TFSA, the income earned in there is tax-free. 
And there's also the opportunity um, that you may look at uh, increasing your charitable giving at that point um, because it allows you to see uh, the how the charity is going to use your money and the benefits that uh, that your donations give to that charity. So if you were contemplating doing some current gifting of, of your RIF, um, just some of the things to think about is you may not need the income now, but will you need it later on? Um, depending on your cost, depending, depending on your situation. And the other thing is, is, is there other non-taxable assets? So if you're gonna take your RIF and, uh, and gift it to somebody, yes, you get the donation, uh, but at the same time, it goes into your income. And so all the clawbacks and everything come into play. So maybe there's some non-taxable assets that you can donate some excess cash that you've got sitting around or whatever uh, that would be available for, for gifting that won't affect your income. Uh, the other thing is if, if you wanted to take 10,000 out of your RIF, for instance, and donate it to, uh, to a charity, uh, you gotta remember that you're gonna have a tax withholding off the top. So it's, you know, for 10,000, you're probably going to lose 20% off the top. Um, so you've only got 8,000 to donate without dipping into your other funds. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's a cash flow thing because you get the money back when you file your tax returns, but it's still, uh, it's still a consideration to remember. And just remember that the clawbacks, if, if your taxable income goes up, your clawbacks on the old age securities particular um, is going to come into play. So um, this is just a little picture that we use to uh, show what happens uh, when you pass away. If you consider that all of your money and possessions are um, are your capital and you have your personal capital that, that you're going to leave to your heirs um, but you also have what's called social capital and that's what you owe the government in taxes on your rifts uh, there may be some appreciated assets that you have to pay capital gains on um, and other things that may come up that you have to pay on pay tax on that final tax return. Um, so that's really social capital. And we call it social capital because hopefully the government is going to uh, use the money to fulfill their social responsibility. Um, so, and we call this the default because if you don't do anything, this is what's going to happen. Um, so for those of us who uh, believe that the government may not spend some of our money the way that they would want it spent, there is an alternative and we can self-direct our social capital through donations. This allows us to support charities we know will spend the money we want the way we want it spent. And uh, and even doing this, we're still able to uh, direct a sizable portion of our personal capital to our loved ones. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here, just as a uh, suggestion. So um, in this situation, there's, it's an individual who has a, uh, a $200,000 RIF or RSP. Uh, the last of the two of them dies. Um, and so, you know, 46% tax bracket. You know, if you think of, um, if you think of $200,000 getting added to your income today, uh, 
200, 46% is not out of line. So, so 92,000 of that 200,000 goes to the government and 108,000 would be divided up as per the will instructions. However, if you were to have the same individual who named a charity or the foundation as a beneficiary, the 200,000 would more or less wipe out the uh, $92,000 tax bill and zero to the government. So, um, you know, that's just an example of what you may want to do um, with your RIF. Now, the other example that I want to spend a little bit of time on is, and, and this is actually an example out of uh, Advisors with Purpose. Um, it's an actual situation. And in this, uh, this situation, the um, couple had uh, an estate that was worth uh, roughly $1.3 million. Uh, it was a representative a principal residence. There was a small vacation house and there was an RSP and there was a life insurance policy. So after tax, the estate was worth a million and 96,000. So 366,000, um, the way they had it set up was 366,000. They had three kids went to each of their children. Um, so there is a concept called um, uh, a child called charity. Um, and so really what that does is it takes the million and 96,000, divides it four ways instead of three ways. Um, so 274,000 a piece. But when you factor in the tax savings and pass that on to the kids versus the charity, um, the amount that was that uh, has been re that the estate has been reduced to uh, to the kids is only uh, only come down to 314,000. So I think it's important and it's an important question that each of us has to answer is how much do we want to leave to our children? Um, now, if you want this to, uh, uh, if you want this to, this scenario to happen, um, just make sure that your lawyer is, uh, gets it written properly in the will um, to, uh, to achieve the result that's, that's shown here. Uh, as you can see, there is a substantial tax savings. And so um, these are just a couple of examples of popular strategies that could be used uh, depending on your personal situation. Now, if anything that I've said has raised any questions, you can send them to Debbie now. Um, and if these ideas have tweaked any your interest and you'd like to uh, see how they might be applicable to your personal situation, we do uh, provide estate planning services by phone. Um, usually it entails about one to three meetings. Um, maximum length is about an hour. Um, and we discuss your situation. You will receive a, a personalized estate plan for your will. Um, takes, it's very confidential. Nobody will ever see it except us. Um, it considers family issues, tax issues, personal issues. Um, and there's, uh, we don't sell anything. There's no obligation to you. And the best news is that there's no cost to you. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, their time tonight. Uh, hopefully, it's been some benefit to you, and I will pass it back to Debbie. Great. Bill, thank you so very much. That's so much information tonight.
that's a lot of good information that I've gotten some already. Actually, Bill, you can stay on camera unless you're getting a drink there. Um, uh, but you, uh, people have already said thank you, that there's good, been good tips and information. So just to reiterate what Bill has said about the next steps. So the next step um, is that we have free confidential uh, estate planning available for you uh, through our partners of the charities that invited you this evening. Um, we have available people like Bill that can come alongside and help you think through uh, and make informed decisions in your will. So as Bill said, it's one to three meetings. The first one is the planning session and it uh, is where the plan, um, advisor is going to get to know you and your situation. Uh, and then we're going to walk you right through to getting that will updated and uh, to the point where you're going to get it executed uh, by a lawyer and we can even help you get that done as well. So thank you, Bill. Um, you're going to hear from our colleague. Her name is Tanya Rust. Tanya, her email comes through as the word trust, T Rust, at Advisors with Purpose. She's going to follow up with you in the next few days um, and with a link to this webinar, first of all, the recording, but also an invitation for you to take part uh, in your own um, plan with an estate advisor. So I really strongly encourage you to take part in that. There's been some great questions come in, Bill. So if you're up to a few of them, just so that you know, we're not going to get to all of them because there's too many already here, uh, but we, I guarantee you, we will follow up with answers to you individually. Um, so if we don't ask yours live, we'll make sure that you get an answer individually. So Bill, the first one, are taxes on a R RIF reduced if gifted to a charity? Can it be gifted now or is it better to wait until will, the will is executed? You're muted, Bill. Okay. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay, so is it the question is is it better to gift it now versus gifting it Good. when yeah. you pass it? Yeah, that's right. To a charity. Um, yeah. Yeah. It. Um, I mean, it depends on the situation. Um, I talked about the clawbacks with, you know, what happens is you. It's still going to come into income, and then your donations end up um, reducing the taxes that it costs you, but there may be some clawbacks and so on, depending on your personal tax situation. So, um, you know, every situation is different and unique. Um, you know, you probably should have a good look at it, but it, it, it may well be worth it if you don't need the funds later to, uh, to donate them now. And that's definitely something one of the advisors can help, right, with, with making that yes, decision? absolutely, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, can a beneficiary of a RIF just be a friend? I don't think there's any limitation on who the beneficiary can be. Um, you can give it to whoever you want. You have to pay tax on it first, you know, is, is the bottom line. Right, right. If you're not your spouse or the charity, you have to yeah. pay the tax, right? Yeah. Does an infirm child need to be under 18? No, the infirm child, if they're financially dependent, um, technically don't have, they have to be, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of complicated rules and every situation is different, but in general, if they qualify for the disability credit uh, and they're financially dependent on you, then then you could. And I think there, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I think there's a limitation on how much you can give to that. Like you can't you can't give a million dollar RSP, but I think it's two hundred thousand or something. You can do. Um, okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Uh, is, it, is there a difference in taxation if the spouse gets the RSP money through the estate instead of directly? Um, the, the, if, it's, if, if it's a successor annuit, um, then, uh, then it, there's no tax effect at all. If there is, um, if it's left to her in the will um, and or um, 
yeah, if it's if it's left to her through the will, then it technically it comes in the income and out again <laughs> with a transfer to another RSP basically, and it um, um, th there's a little bit of paperwork to it, but in the end the taxation is the same. Good. Yeah. Here's a question, Bill, that I'm going to try to answer as best as I can. It says, your company name is Advisors with Purpose. And what is your purpose of doing these free seminar seminars and estate advising? That's a great question. Advisors with Purpose is a charity, and we work with over about 40 charities, of which one invited you this, to this evening's webinar. They actually provide or pay us a fee to provide this service for you free of charge. So that fee uh, is an annual fee. So we advise that you take advantage of it. We want as many people to take advantage of it as possible. Um, and that allows us to provide this. There's no sales. There's no hidden agendas. We all want to make sure that we finish well, that you make informed decisions. Um, the, uh, the reality is, is that we all will have a time when our will is going to be executed, whether we know we have a will or not, whether we've written it, if you haven't written it, the government has. So, um, you know, we make sure that we do and we're, it's, we're all going to be good stewards of what God has provided with us, uh, us. So part of this is that we finish well. And so Advisors with Purpose is a charity that's been around doing this for over 10 years. Um, and so it's uh, uh, Lauren Jackson is our founder, and he started in 2002 with a charity called the Canadian National Christian Foundation. And out of that has come Advisors with Purpose. So uh, if you'd like more information, you can look at our website. It's www.advisorswithpurpose.ca, or you can feel free to give me a call, 1-866-336-3315 um, anytime, and I can give you more information about that as well. So um, let's just grab one more question, Bill, if you're okay with that. Um, and as I said, the rest, we will make sure that we follow up with you. I want to go back to the very first one that came in. Um, and I'm not even sure if I'm going to ask it correctly, but it says, I have a question under qualified beneficiary. None applies to me. So I'm presuming maybe they're single. Therefore, do I have to do a will? Do I have to, it says, do I have to do a will to whom I wanted to give it to then. So I think they're saying, do they have to name in their will who they want the RSP to go to? Well, again, you can you can still name a beneficiary. Uh, it'd be a non-qualifying one. So the estate, just, just be aware that the estate has to pay the tax on it. Uh, and the beneficiary that they name gets the full amount of the RIF. So, you know, if it doesn't go through the estate, then there may be a cash flow problem, uh, depending on what else is in the estate. Right. Okay. Very good. What well, do you know, what folks? We're going to wrap up there just because it's already what time? Bill is out in the East Coast, so it's already almost ten o'clock for him. My uh, we, appreciate, <laughs> yeah, we appreciate everyone joining us. We will be in touch. Look for that email from Tanya Rust, Trust at Advisors with Purpose. And uh, we'll follow up with you with a link to the webinar and a link to, for you to join us and uh, have your own free consultation and time of planning with our advisors. So thank you and good night.